Okay, so I think maybe we should go ahead and uh, get things started. So welcome to everyone who's joining us via Zoom and also on YouTube. Uh, my name is Mary Brazelton, and I'm Zooming in from the University of Cambridge um, to chair this, the 2023 Hughes Prize Lecture uh, for the British Society for the History of Science. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have the author of the winning book uh, with us here, Professor Keith Weilu. Um, who will be speaking about his really fantastic book, uh, Pushing Cools. Um, so I'll say a bit about Keith, uh, and then I'll say a bit about the book uh, before he uh, gets started with his lecture. Um, so Keith Weilu is the Henry Putnam University Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton, jointly appointed in the Department of History and the School of Public and International Affairs. Um, he's well known for very many contributions to uh, history and especially the history of medicine. Um, those of you in the audience who went to graduate school for the history of medicine may have had to read several books uh, for your qualifying exams. I know I did, um, starting with Drawing Blood in 1997, um, Technology and Disease Identity in 20th Century America, Dying in the City of the Blues on Sickle Cell Anemia and the Politics of Race and Health from 2001, Keith has written a number of other books, The Troubled Dream of Genetic Medicine, How Cancer Crossed the Color Line by Oxford, with Oxford, Pain, A Political History with Johns Hopkins in 2015. And so it's perhaps not that surprising to see how in 2021 he received the Dan David Prize for his influential body of historical scholarship focused on race, science, and health equity, on the social implications of medical innovation, and on the politics of disease. In addition to these uh, credits, he's also... Uh, co-chaired a National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Committee, which produced the 2023 report Toward Equitable Innovation and Health and Medicine, a Framework. And so it's with these contributions to history and policy um, that we can perhaps turn towards his uh, book, Pushing Cool, uh, which I think uh, does quite a lot to really advance uh, history with policy implications very much in mind. Um, and that was certainly the impression that the prize jury uh, got as we looked through um, the submissions. Um, and I'll just briefly uh, quote from that citation. Um, and I should also give credit here to uh, fellow jury members, Subhadra Das, Anna Marie Ruse, Ali Boyle, Nana Kalund, and Deborah Cohen, um, who really uh, were an incredible team for me to work with as chair of the prize jury. And we agreed that among an extraordinarily strong field of shortlisted books, Keith Whalow's revolutionary uh, and revelatory uh, Pushing Cool, Big Tobacco, Racial Marketing, and the Untold Story of the Menthol Cigarette stood out for its originality and timeliness. In telling the story of menthol cigarettes targeted marketing in African-American communities, Whalow draws on meticulous research to uncover the enmeshment of social sciences, racial exploitation, and corporate interests with catastrophic consequences for public health in the United States. So I'll stop there and hand things over to Keith. Thank you so much for giving us uh, such a wonderful book. Well, um, thank you, Mary, and thank you to the jury. Let me just, I'm trying to get my screen up and running. I think I have it. Um, thank you, Mary, and thanks to the jury for this just wonderful honor. I'm really, uh, you know, deeply honored by the recognition uh, of the Hughes Prize from the British Society for the History of Science. And I'm really delighted to, to give the Hughes Prize lecture today. Um, let me just launch in and you know, note that for the past two years, and in fact more, the US Food and Drug Administration has sought to move forward with banning the menthol cigarette, menthol flavored cigarettes in the US amid, amidst competing scientific, health, and political claims. Um, uh, earlier this year, they said that uh, this final decision on the ban would be announced by the end of August. And in August, they announced that it would be sometime in the, the next few months. Now, the arguments for in favor of a ban, uh, as articulated by public health advocates, epidemiologists, and others, have been fairly forceful and effective at getting us to this point. Um, they argue that menthol, which we all know the experience associated with menthol, that refreshing and cool flavor, that, that, that sensation that wafts across the mucous membranes when you take a bite of a um, 
ice cream that is mentholated or toothpaste, uh, brush your teeth with toothpaste that's mentholated, or in fact, any product that has this menthol, which is uh, derived from the oil that's often crystallized from uh, the peppermint plant. It's a very, very distinctive experience that public health advocates argue has been used by the industry successfully to position mentholated products as young, hip, new, and healthy. Public health scholars also point out that mentholated smoking, mentholated tobacco products, produce a deep, deeper inhalation, uh, are correlated with higher rates of disease and lower rates of quitting. And flavored cigarettes in general, and menthol in particular, have long been seen as an enticement, particularly for young people who are intended to take up smoking. But one of the other key features of mentholated smoking in the United States is the fact that over 70% of African-American smokers, that is black people who smoke, prefer mentholated brands as opposed to 30% of white smokers. So by and large, white smokers smoke more menthols than black smokers, but of those who smoke, African-Americans disproportionately prefer mentholated brands. And this targeted marketing has been enfolded with the scientific claims to support the argument for a ban. The industry's arguments have also been forceful in resisting a ban. They argue that the majority of menthol smokers are white, that even if uh, African-American smokers disproportionately prefer mentholated smoking, it is a legitimate flavor preference for them and ought not to be banned because of that. And they also argue once they finally conceded that tobacco smoking is in fact hazardous to your health, that menthol does not actually change the inherent health dangers of smoking. Um, as I said, the argument for a ban has been in the works for quite a while, uh, arguably uh, since 2009. And to understand today's regulatory debate, that is to say, why is the FDA Food and Drug Administration even considering this, we have to go back to the year 2009. Um, that is an eventful, a pivotal year in the history of tobacco regulation in the United States. When President Obama is pictured here signing in June of 2009, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. And um, this act explains the current limbo of menthol smoking. Uh, what this act, act did was for the first time in US history, grant the Food and Drug Administration authority over the regulation of tobacco. So for the entire 20th century, uh, for decades and decades prior, the FDA had zero uh, jurisdiction over tobacco products. That changed in 2009. It also banned flavored cigarettes, regarding them as illegitimate enticements, particularly for young smokers, um, as a starter product to start cigarette smoking. But perhaps shockingly, but I'll explain why, menthols were excluded from the flavor ban. Menthols remained legal, uh, ensuing, ensuring that there would be continued debate. When reporting on the arguments for a menthol ban, the New York Times pointed to a particularly important split among black congressional officials. A rift had opened up among the 43 member black congressional caucus over a menthol provision in the legislation that would enable the FDA to regulate tobacco. And one of the key arguments um, or at least proponents for not banning menthol was a representative from uh, Brooklyn named Adolphus Towns who was often called the Congress's Marlboro man uh, because of the uh, extensive support he received campaign donations from the tobacco industry. And the architect of the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, Henry Waxman, saw that if he pushed forward with including menthol in this ban, that he ran the risk of losing this legislation altogether. And as he noted, he was, as the New York Times noted, uh, Waxman was unwilling to risk the bill's passage by making changes in the menthol language. And the result was a stalemate. Uh, menthol was not included at the ban, but the Food and Drug Administration in 2009 was handed authority to weigh in 
to draw the final conclusions. And in some ways we have been waiting for those conclusions ever since. Now, my book looks at the long and complicated history of how we got here. And in order to understand you know, the circumstances that began in 2009, leading ultimately to uh, a would-be ban on menthol, we need to start back in the early part of the 20th century. Um, in which menthol smoking began as a feature of American consumer con commerce with the, a new brand called Spud in 1926 and then Cool Cigarettes in 1933, which began with a deceptive promise. Menthol cigarettes did not begin as a brand that was focused on any particular racial group or ethnic group, or in fact, any specific demographic other than people who were concerned with what was called smoker's throat. That is to say, uh, mentholated smoking was largely mar marketed from the 1920s through the 30s into the 40s for therapeutic purposes. Um, ads like this in the Chicago Tribune asked, do you have smoker's throat? Menthol cigarettes were seen as a wonderful break for those who were suffering from congestion, irritated throats from their regular smokes, who needed a break, uh, who needed a therapeutic break. And so the mascot for cool cigarettes, really the penguin could say in a 1952 cartoon advertising, when April showers make you cough like crazy, refreshing cools taste fresh as a daisy. Got a cough, switch from hots to cools. So menthol came into the market uh, for these cold relieving therapeutic properties. And the industry promised that mentholated smoking would expand the airways, would relieve congestion, would in the same way that a lozenge did, uh, provide a therapeutic alternative to harsh smoking. Now, let me pause here and say that this was a deceptive promise from the outset, uh, because as physiologists would explain to the industry, menthol did nothing to expand the airways. It was a clever perversion of sensation to give the feeling of coolness wafting across the mucous membranes, the nose and the throat, give the feeling of an expanded airways, give a feeling of you know, the actual temperature of your throat being cooled when in fact, no such transformations in physiology had happened. The term a perversion of sensation actually entered the vocabulary of, of, of uh, menthol smoking when a advertising executive working on behalf of cool uh, makers went to Yale, to the Yale Laboratory for Applied Physiology to, act, to ask a, a researcher named Howard Haggard for uh, some studies, particularly on rats, that might help the industry to navigate some of the challenges of bringing these new market, these new products into the market. Haggard advised the makers of Cool on how to use the rat studies uh, of in his laboratory to help the company dodge malicious claims of competitors that menthol itself was an irritant, and also how to undercut what Haggard saw as fatuous assertions by another maker of menthol, Spuds that their additive actually lowered the temperature of the throat. Howard Haggard, when he first began working with these advertisers, insisted that his work should not be used to sell cigarettes, was purely intended to get at the truth of what menthols did in the throat, in the nose, and elsewhere in the body. So he studied menthols, but later on he grew frustrated when marketers sought to use his information, use his findings to sell cigarettes. And so in a correspondence, an ongoing correspondence, when they finally raised this question of using his um, physiological studies for the purposes of selling cools, he wrote, you yourself emphasize neither our names nor that of the university will under any circumstances be exploited in advertising for cool cigarettes. It, but now it's exactly that exploitation that you are suggesting. So this gives you a sense of the way in which scientific insight of the physiological character and then later on psychology, health psychology, social sciences, 
And the sciences of various types were marshaled by consultants, marketers, industry insiders in service of making, growing, sustaining, and in some cases, defending uh, menthol markets. The correspondence like this allow me to look in some ways behind the curtain of how markets were made, built, sustained, and defended. And I should explain then that the, the, the book is built upon a fantastic uh, archive. The sources of communication and many others in the book derive from the tobacco archive documents, uh, which were made possible following the master settlement agreement in which states attorneys general uh, settled with uh, the tobacco industry around these claims of long-term smoking causing adverse health for the US people across the US population. And the settlement produced um, documentation um, through the discovery process that has subsequently become widely available, searchable from my computer, from any computer anywhere, to look behind the curtain. of this. And the story I chose to tell is the story uh, of the intimate connections between the sciences, social science research, physiology, study, physiological studies of the mucous membranes, health psychology, and elsewhere, it's sciences, of various types being marshaled by consultants, marketers, and others in service of building markets. And these are just some of the organizations that perform the kinds of scientific studies that help to underpin the work of the industry. Uh, they studied um, their companies like the Psychological Corporation, Lewis Harris, the Polster, a company called the Institute for Motivational Research, and many, many others studying health beliefs and how you turn health beliefs and health experiences into markets. It was, uh, for, for the first 20 years of menthol smoking, it was a niche market. Uh, as I said, mostly for people suffering from irritated throats who needed a temporary break. And so menthol smoking, whether it was spuds or cools, uh, we're no more than two or three percent of the overall uh, cigarette sales in the United States. And then something happened in the post-World War II era. It would be psychologists and not physiologists who figured prominently in the next stage of menthol's positioning. As industry analyst Harry Wooten noted, and other consultants did as well, the post-World War II market was fickle. But what he saw was a distinct uptick, a large uptick in menthol smoking, uh, concerned and driven by a perverse worry. With the 1952 publication by British epidemiologist Richard Dahl and A. Bradford Hill showing that lung cancer uh, in men had quadrupled in the past 20 years correlated with smoking rates, uh, news of this rippled across the world in, and across the United States, leading Reader's Digest to decry the industry <clears throat> for producing cancer by the carton. And in this context, industry analysts like Wooten would write that the so-called cancer scare is a psychological factor that no one can evaluate accurately, changing the type rather than the volume of smoking. And it's in this context that other scholars like Ernest Dichter, uh, founder of the Institute for Motivational Research, a Freudian trained psychologist, a European emigre to the United States, uh, would understand that the choice of type of cigarette was driven by health motivation, style motivation, and also aesthetic motivation. And increasingly studies like Dichter's identified anxiety as a driver in menthols, uh, the uptake in menthol smoking. Menthol was for people who were susceptible to genuine anxiety. And so cancer became a major driver in explaining the shift towards menthol smoking in the 1950s as industry insiders, psychologists were explaining to the industry. Um, 
there were powerful undercurrents um, of cancer worry shaping smoking preference. As Dichter wrote, Salem, this new cigarette, which emerged in the 1950s, the new lighter menthol brand than the more heavily, quote, medicated menthol brand Spud and Cool, suddenly saw a dramatic rise in popularity. And Dichter wrote, he's the, also the author of a book called The Psychology of Everyday Living, that Salem as a cigarette is a little more for upper income bracket people. Cools, on the contrary, are seen as very clearly a lower income cigarette, a feeling that cool is smoked by older and retired people. Other companies like the Market Planning Corporation also did studies on health consciousness and noted that Cool and Salem smokers are acutely conscious of their health. The personality tests show that menthol smokers' concern about their health is based on deeper lying aspects of their personalities. They're much more aware than the average person about health, and they're always aware of how they feel. And they were people in the context of cancer worries who were searching for a compromise. As this interview, as this study based on 750 interviews noted, these people can neither give up smoking easily nor smoke without feeling some threat, and therefore they compromise. Smoking cools and smoking Salem's, uh, in the view of the, the scientists at the Market Planning Corporation, was an evasion. Many of these smokers try to evade the issue raised by cancer research, but they face a dilemma. The menthol smoker wants a great deal from his cigarette and he is not prepared to give up some qualities. These demands are both exacting and contradictory. It is no wonder, said this study, that many have been searching, shopping and switching from brand to brand to find the cigarette that qualifies. In Salem, they found an illusion of safety because Salem represents to its current users a satisfying and unprecedented compromise of several conflicting demands. It is very mild, being both filtered and mentholated, but it has flavor. It has enough menthol to give the clean smoothing effect associated with mentholated cigarettes, but not enough to overpower the taste of the tobacco, which is what its smokers want. It seems safe, but not forbidding. So by looking at physiologists and psychologists in these first two eras in the history of mentholated smoking, I'm able to look, as this archive allows me to, behind the curtain, to look at what uh, the journalist Vance Packard called the hidden persuaders, uh, the consultants, the economists, the physiologists, the sociologists, urban studies scholars who would arrive on the scene a little bit later, and the social scientists studying preferences, and looking at their, the way in which their studies were used to tailor mark approaches to marketing. It's also a, in, a story of intense competition between the makers of Cool, the makers of Salem, the makers of another product that would arrive on the scene, Newport, and also uh, makers uh, like the, the makers of Marlboro, <coughs> Philip Morris, which would never actually find a successful menthol brand, but studied why these other companies were successful. It's the story of the making of markets, uh, as well as the early years of what might be called, you know, behavioral economics or behavioral health. I would argue, as I do in the book, that the industry was doing behavioral health research. They were doing black studies, as you'll see shortly, long before black studies or in fact gender studies existed or urban studies existed as an academic field, but they were doing it in service of creating markets. And when television and radio ads were banned <clears throat> and billboards became the new modality for reaching smokers, they studied visibility, they studied placement, they studied the impact of imagery on behavior. But in the 1950s, if you ask most tobacco executives where the growth market for menthols were, they would never have said, in fact, they would look to you askance if you'd said, you know, urban black populations, because unquestionably, the growth market for menthols in the 1950s and the early 1960s were colleges. These were the leading edges of menthol advertising. College newspapers were the leading uh, outlets for advertisements from tobacco companies. 
This is where you built lasting markets, where you sustained markets through persuasion, through incentives, through image making, and through a network of influencers like hiring student um, sales representatives, distributing free samples, couponing on campuses, advertising in college newspapers, et cetera, promotions and giveaways using school mascots as the basis for those campaigns. So in early 1960s, when um, Ernest Dichter wrote a study uh, for Young and Rubicam, the advertising company, on the motivations of cigarette smoking, he identified different kinds of potentials for new markets. And the youth market was unquestionably the first. Um, but as links to cancer were growing in the 1950s into the 1960s, regulators at the national level, as well as at state levels, were becoming wary of the argument that tobacco advertising was aimed at kids, aimed at youth. And they looked askance with deep concern at the college and certainly any advertising that seemed oriented towards high school students. And because of the pressure, because of the threat of restrictions um, from legislators, the industry preemptively withdrew from college advertising. So the other market that somebody like Ernest Dichter would have focused on is the older market, but then increasingly in the context of this anxiety and concern about aggressive advertising to youth, health psychologists began to understand the value of turning to what Dichter called the status seeking market. He wrote, in this country, the Negro market in particular has been a fruitful outlet for many status products. The natural desire to achieve equality in every way possible has prompted the Negro consumer to the extensive purchase of all those products which are seen as being indicative of a raised socioeconomic and cultural level. Filtered cigarettes represent such a product and so too did menthol cigarettes. And so it is in the early 1950s that you begin to see a conversation among, uh, among consultants for the industry about how to bend towards Black aspirations in the context of uh, African-American urbanization uh, and suburb suburbanization that was leading towards the larger proportions of African-Americans living in American cities um, and the emergence of what would later be called inner cities. What you see here in this graph is the uptick. Um, the first report of the link between smoking and cancer producing uh, an upsurge in first Salem smoking. Um, cool share of the broader market remains relatively flat, but then rises very slowly right around the time of the, what the industry calls the second cancer scare, that is the 1964 Surgeon General's report on tobacco smoking and cancer. So the 1960s is the era in which you see an increasing public critique of youth-oriented marketing and an aggressive public uh, pivot by the industry to the cities, using exactly the same strategies that they used on college campuses, focus groups, psychographic studies, street corner interviews to understand issues of anxiety, identity, health worries, gender concerns, uh, and also how, in, how selection of brand related to perceptions of self. And all of these studies would be used to inform advertising themes, placement, and marketing. I mentioned that Philip Morris was always unsuccessful at breaking into this market. Alpine was one of its product, and here you see one of their less successful advertising campaigns attempting to use the same strategies they used to, in rebranding Marlboro away from being a feminine cigarette to being a masculine cigarette. They were trying to make that move in the 1950s and 1960s with Alpine. But it was Philip Morris, it was um, Brown and Williamson with Cool Cigarettes that really made the pivot most aggressively in 1964, in the summer of 64, in fact. And you begin to see increasing images like this, Elston Howard, the first African-American uh, player on the New York Yankees, um, advertising coming up to cool. This is on the street corner in Chicago, or a more opinionated uh, view of cool smoking in uh, appropriate to the 
70s. The, the rise of cool and menthol's pivot into the city coincides with uh, really signal moments in African-American history, which intersect with signal moments in the history of smoking. So you have the protest marches in Washington, but you also have the Surgeon General's report. You have the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and you also have uh, a study of national smoking habits, the March on Montgomery, the Voting Rights Act. These are all intertwined events in the mid 1960s, in which you start to see the industry adapting the menthol as medication theme to new times, new context, new anxieties, and new desires. One of the most revealing documents that gives you a sense of the new strategies of how industry builds markets is a document that is produced uh, about Black St. Louis in, 19, in November of 1967. It's a Madison Avenue proposal that comes from the company Dancer Fitzgerald and Sample about how to create a camel menthol market in Negro St. Louis. Um, and it starts by explaining that this is to summarize our thoughts on a way to reach the Negro market for camel menthol, and specifically what we recommend doing now in the Negro area of St. Louis. Given the context of the times, it's not surprising that they refer to the importance of tapping into generational tensions. Negroes, says this document, don't want what daddy used to smoke or drink. That's old fashioned. That's lower class. The important issue here is to appeal to black pride and reject uh, in rejecting white standards. The Negroes no longer look to the white market and its purchasing norms and habits to set the pace in what to buy. Again, Negroes are becoming increasingly proud of the fact that they are Negroes and they are now rejecting many of the standards or patterns set by the white community. The document goes on to talk about the intimate and secretive way in which one builds influence and following for a brand in both Working and social situations, Negroes tend to gravitate to groups and Negro men usually spend more time with their respective groups than the average white man says this finding, whether it be bars, club meetings, on the street or at their jobs. Within these groups, there are centers of influence, individuals who lead the others because they are either A, more in the know, or B, they are more forceful. These are not leaders in the sense of being president of the PTA or local civic organization, but might well be a barber, a numbers man, a bellhop, a bartender, or a taxi driver who likes to show how smart he is with his pals and associates. They are kingfish. And these are the best way of spreading the news. They have a strong desire for status and class. And our strategy in building a following for camel menthol is to deliver to them boast material, boast material, we must impart prestige and factual knowledge in a personalized, almost secret manner, in addition to the product itself. It's free samples, but it's also this idea that of, of endowing people with the sense that they have privileged access to something new. We must aim this promotional effort at the leaders and communicators within the Negro cell groups, boast material to show that they're in the know. So this gives you a sense of the intimate strategies that menthol messaging is pivoting towards. And it also shows you how, in some ways, the push is becoming more refined, but how the push in becoming more refined is also inventing a new narrative. You begin to see this by the late 1960s in a study of uh, Salem versus cool preferences among Negroes. Uh, cool being seen as in, in the Negro market, and the makers of Salem wondering how to build a comparable following. It is the cigarette to smoke, says this uh, finding a, a product of the Black Smoker Study. Um, the name itself not only describes a desirable product property, it is also a perfect match, claims this finding, with what may be the most highly valued personality trait among Negroes, i.e. savoir faire or coolness. Here you see a document that, elim that elaborates on the, how the architects of an elaborate push as described by the previous, previous documents create the narrative of an inherent pull. That is to say that menthols are a perfect match with black personality even at the same time that documents within the industry acknowledge 
that in blind taste tests across the United States, across populations, smokers' perception of menthol delivery, in other words, smoke, smokers might say that they prefer higher menthol content, and that is why they prefer cools, but smokers' perception of menthol delivery is not at all veridical. Image, uh, the industry understood, is what drove preferences. The industry also studied closely the sociology of race and racism and how it underpinned buying and brand behavior, how it could be used to guide advertising and how it should adjust to shifting racial attitudes. That is, uh, early on in the 1960s, there was a sense that in the early 1970s, there was a sense that white youth emulation of black culture was also pulling white youth towards smoking cools Whereas in the mid 1970s, there was a sense that white youth alienation from black culture was driving them away from menthol smoking. And one study in Chicago pointed out, for instance, in the set late 70s, that feelings of racism, particularly anti-black racism, are more widespread among Chicago white people than in the country generally. And anti-black feelings are also expressed in their dislike for integrated ads. The, the national atmosphere for smoking cig cigarette advertising was forbidding for the industry leading into the early 1970s. In the United States, their, um, Congress passed a national radio and TV advertising ban. And what this meant is an intensified focus on urban advertising, on billboards, on posters, on public transit, on point of sale outreach on free samples in the city. I won't go into details, but these documents give a sense of the intimate way in which industry companies, companies like Lorillard are studying not just um, bus lines, but who travels on bus lines and which neighborhoods those bus lines go through. So a black a bus line that takes black folks from uh, their community into downtown for work, but passage passes through white neighborhoods can advertise aggressively uh, black themed menthol smoking images on the inside, but not on the outside of the bus. It's also now none of these markets would have been possible without support from black media. From the mid 1960s and onward, um, media outlets like Ebony, uh, its publisher, John H. Johnson, uh, the founder, uh, would argue that African-Americans were in a segregated society always seeking what he called compensatory gratification. Patronizing first-class eating establishments, he wrote, in a comfortable manner is not always easy. Outlays of money for country clubs, resorts, and similar recreation in most instances is out of the question. Therefore, Negro Americans who are forced outside the mainstream of American life in so many ways achieve compensatory gratification in ways that are often quite surprising to the rest of Americans. Sometimes they overconsume and sometimes they underconsume. And it's not surprising that at Ebony Magazine, uh, you could see images like the one on the right, which promote cool as a kind of a, a statement about uh, uh, the ways in which um, compensatory gratification could be achieved for Black Americans. Now, menthol's rise continues through the 1970s into the 1980s, as do billboards to bring knowledge of menthol smoking closer and closer to uh, Black populations. In fact, this is in some ways where I came into the menthol story myself personally, growing up in New York City, um, in the 1970s, surrounded by a world of billboards. Little did I know how recent this phenomenon had been, the proliferation of urban billboards as a response to the banning of radio and television advertisements. By the late 1980s, you begin to see a pushback brewing. And another pivotal moment arrives um, with the, this is one example of the pushback, which is one of the fav my favorite characters in the book is a man named Henry McNeil Brown, who went by Mandrake, who took aim at the proliferation of billboards in Chicago by blackwashing and whitewashing over them in acts of vandalism, an act that was echoed by other community activists across the, the country. But it was really a controversy about a new R.J. Reynolds brand uh, called Uptown, 
that really pulled back the curtain and revealed the complexity of how it is that menthol marketing, menthol, menthol flavored cigarettes had created a web around black communities. R.J. Reynolds announced uh, that it would come up with a, a, a themed um, menthol brand that was specifically and exclusively for African-Americans. Um, and they did so aggressively and um, unsparingly and unapologetically. Uh, in the early, late 1998, late 1989 and early 1990. Uptown um, was greeted with derision, particularly from an unlikely source, um, Louis Sullivan, um, then the, the first African-American cabinet member, uh, Health and Human Services Secretary, uh, under the Republican George Herbert Walker Bush, a physician and a Republican appointee who went um, in, out in front and said that Uptown's message is more disease, more suffering and more death for a group already bearing more than its share of smoking related illness and mortality. This in the Wall Street Journal in a business friendly environment and from a business friendly administration. R.J. Reynolds and the tobacco industry found uh, that it had unlikely supporters, having built close ties to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, uh, through funding for its urban initiatives. And so it was Benjamin Hooks, the executive director of the NAACP, who came out in defense of the industry. And here you see this fascinating and troubling moment in which you have two um, national figures, both claiming to speak for uh, African American health and well being, one in favor of aggressive targeted marketing, and the other a physician unalterably opposed. I should point out that, um, that let me go back for a second, that uh, the winner of this particular battle was Louis Sullivan. Um, shortly after um, he came out against this particular brand, R.J. Reynolds was compelled to withdraw it. But the battle lines, the, the, the controversy itself exposed both the industry tactics to wide public discussion, but it also exposed the unlikely supporters that existed in the black community that were helping the industry along in building its markets. The industry would be unbowed. Uh, this is a recurring strategy that it would employ from the 60s through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and still today, which is a recurring practice of appealing to Black pride, Black self-determination, and Black well-being. Um, a smaller company came out, for instance, in 1993 with a brand called Menthol X. It was released by a company one year after the release of Spike Lee's historical film Malcolm X. A Philip, a Philip Morris document noted that the boxes resemble a poster used to promote the film, Malcolm X. The pack is decorated in the Pan-African national flags colors of black, red, and green, which some say are symbolic of black culture. The scheme was intensely criticized um, for using racial pride to lure buyers from the black community, leading to the product being pulled from the market, as was Uptown. Now, there are a couple of ironies here. Um, first of all, Malcolm X, being Muslim, um, would decry the fact that every regular priced carton bought meant that the white man's government took around $2 of a black man's hard earned money. This is a way of exploiting African Americans for the health and well being of the industry. But also since the 1960s in the industry archives, it became clear that the industry was aware and concerned that followers of the black Muslim movement were cigarette abstainers, a trend that they followed very closely. Well, let me wrap up by saying a little bit about where the story goes forward. Um, what, what my book does is it shows the long and in some ways meandering history of the menthol cigarette and how it landed uh, at the last stages of the story on the question of, I can't breathe. So um, when I was finishing the book, well, let me, let me say before we get to the end of the book, the, the, the history that I tell here is the history of how menthol markets were created and sustained 
And for the purposes of this presentation today, the role of scientific studies of sensation, taste, identity, status, and health in building, sustaining, and defending that those markets and the and defending the web that has been that has kept menthol in place. It's not just a story of science, it's also the story of black media, civil rights leaders, and others. But ultimately the story lands uh, with, uh, my, in my conclusion, with the question of deception by design and the long road to I can't breathe. How did I get there? Well, when I was, um, when I was writing the conclusion of this book um, in early 19, the early 2020, um, of course, we experienced a global pandemic, and also we experienced the, the murder of George Floyd. And it struck me as I was writing the conclusion to this book that these were three stories that sadly and tragically were all ending in the same place, whether it was, you know, uh, uh, a police officer's knee on the neck of a man crying, I can't breathe, whether it was, um, a, a cigarette that produced emphysema, lung pathologies also ending in the complaint, I can't breathe, and also COVID, uh, decimating lungs, uh, resulting in people on ventilators dying their last breath, perhaps um, saying, I can't breathe. And so the question for me was, how are these stories conjoined? And for me, the stories were conjoined um, because of not just the, the circumstances of, um, of COVID and police brutality and, and uh, as menthol smoking, but they were conjoined because of similar kinds of dynamics. Now, let me explain before I get to that last stage that um, for those who argue for banning menthol cigarettes, there is a recurring answer that comes sometimes from within the black community. And more recently, the argument for keeping menthol cigarettes and not banning them have come from, just like with Benjamin Hooks, from African-American civil rights figures like Al Sharpton, who argue that because Eric Garner was strangled on a street corner selling loose cigarettes, and because George Floyd was murdered outside of a Minneapolis store known for selling menthol cigarettes, that the targeting of menthol smokers will produce more examples of Eric Garner and George Floyd. And so paid by and supported by the industry, by Reynolds American, um, people like Al Sharpton have been arguing that, you know, to ban menthol cigarettes would be to endanger African-American lives. But I end the book on, with deception by design, by, by referring not just to the industry tactics, but by thinking about how it is that these narratives uh, from major civil rights figures like Benjamin Hooks and Al Sharpton gain prominence. And what I argue is that the story I can't breathe um, is conjoined in a couple of different ways. It, 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 all three of these examples, COVID, police violence, and menthols are examples of the way in which processes, some playing out over minutes in the case of Mr. Floyd, sometimes over weeks or months in the case of COVID, or decades in the case of menthol, result in the same endpoint, uh, crippling the ability to breathe over different timescales. The difference, of course, is that the menthol story is not revealed tragically on camera. We can't see it. We can't see the culprit except the goal of my book is to somehow pull back the curtain so you can see a little bit more of who the actors are behind the, the, the curtain playing a role in keeping this tragedy at work. But make no mistake, whether it is a story that plays out over minutes or weeks or months or decades, the story ends in the same place, uh, tragically with the complaint I can't breathe. And so that I think is a good place to end the story because to me, this is an, a strong argument for why it is that we've reached a point where not because of the scientific arguments and not just because of the social arguments or not just because of the disparities in smoking preference, but really because 
of the historical argument that I've laid out for why ultimately the United States Food and Drug Administration should move forward in its final determination and ultimately finally ban menthol smoking. I will stop there and I would love to take any questions you have and apologies for going over. Thank you so much, Professor Wilu. Um, the one thing that we can't replicate on Zoom is the sound of resounding applause, um, <laughs> which I'm sure would uh, normally be the case, but thank you. That was really, really phenomenal. Um, so as I've said in the chat uh, dialogue, which hopefully everyone attending can see, if you have questions and we hope that you do, um, please put them into the dialogue box for the Q&A and I'll be able to read them aloud. Um, and also if you're watching on YouTube and you want to ask a question, um, please click the link in the description and that will take you, I think, to the right dialogue box. Um, so while we wait for questions to come in, I thought maybe I would uh, get started with one of my own. Um, it was really lovely to hear so many themes of the book coming through in this talk. Um, you know, I, the concept of a sort of slow crisis in public health, um, mm -hmm. you know, that I think is a really powerful one and one that's coming out in a lot of ways in, in different um, books that I've been reading lately. So that's something that I'm going to be, be thinking about. But the question that I had was really about this point that you make, one of the key arguments that you have in this book is the way in which uh, Big Tobacco was doing Black studies long before it existed as a field, this way in which the social sciences were shaped by these kinds of corporate interests. And I think that point speaks to the importance of the social sciences, as mm -hmm. well as this kind of risk, this ability for um, certain kinds of interests to co-op them. Um, and so I guess one question might be, you know, what lessons uh, does this history carry for practitioners? Um, you know, how should practitioners of Black studies, of gender studies and social sciences more generally in history, um, think about their work differently, um, you know, anticipate uh, those kinds of risks more carefully, more clearly? Um, yeah, I'm curious to know your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I have two answers. One is that uh, it was a revelatory to me to see how centrally important issues of like the studies of masculinity, um, masculinity in relationship to issues of race figured in how the industry understood um, how to make markets. And so for instance, there's this really captivating study about why that Philip Morris is trying to understand why the black cowboy does not resonate in urban America in the 1970s. And they do, it's either a, a kind of an admirable sociological, psychological analysis of white masculinity in relationship to black masculinity. But when you realize that it's in service of like how to, how to create a cigarette market, you, you turn from admiring to decrying it. But basically what they argue is that, um, you know, the, the cowboy represents for white suburban male smokers, a kind of alternative to the world in which they live that they see as uh, liberating and freeing and admirable. Whereas for uh, black men in urban settings, they argue, um, their idea of power is rooted in being admired and being having control over the setting in which they they don't currently have control. So the the imagery that one needs to project is of a black man who is being admired by a black woman um, or amidst friends. So, so they have this very sophisticated local understanding of power and influence, like that document in um, 19, late 1960s St. Louis. They understand social hierarchy. They understand influence making. Um, so on the one hand, if they, weren't, if they were selling anything other than cigarettes, <clears throat> you would say this is a very thoughtful and admirable understanding of the nuances of Black identity, uh, gender, and how it works. So I feel like, you know, I've, I've had a, I have a, a, a kind of a, a two part approach to this, which is to admire the, the detail and sophistication of the studies, the focus groups, and also to use the findings to help inform my understanding of what's going on at the time, while also decrying how it is being utilized, how it's being implemented, how it's being uh, 
translate it into sophisticated um, methods. So, so when I teach about this, I, I want students to understand that they're, the methods of social science analysis have extraordinary power. But at the same time that we ought to, you know, as with anything, use it wisely and encourage its wise use in service of, of, of justice and, um, and truly the health and well-being of, of a broader population. You know, after this many years, I still am accidentally muting yeah. myself. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. That's really, really a uh, great answer. And we ha have a question uh, from the audience from Bess Williamson. Um, he wonders if you could say more about the social science surveys that you saw in the archives. Do you have a sense of how empirical they are? Would they stand up to current day survey making standards? How much do you approach them with a kind of grain of salt, knowing that they were produced for tobacco clients? That, it's a great question. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't think that they stand up to um, current survey standards. At the same time, <clears throat> empirically, they are rich. For instance, uh, focus groups um, are used. And so I can actually see the composition of a 16 person focus group, uh, whether it's uh, white women in Birmingham, Alabama, or black men in Birmingham, Alabama, talking about their responses to advertising motifs. Um, I can, so empirically, very, very strong, uneven, but strong. One of the problems as you move through the 1960s, however, is the tendency to find more what you might call armchair racial theorizing informing. So whereas early on, you might have actual focus groups and extrapolations from what the focus groups do, and, and also studies of the limitations of focus groups, um, that Patterson, New Jersey is not the same as Birmingham, Alabama. Um, but by the 60s and 70s, you have a little bit more <clears throat> of this kind of like, you know, theories of blackness that are just being spewed out on the basis of very little uh, empirical finding as if to suggest like we're looking for justifications for why black folks inherently love menthol cigarettes and we're just going to invent theories of it in order to justify our marketing practices. So the, the trick in looking at the archive is that you can find both strong survey techniques you can find um, empirically grounded observations you can certainly find like observations that are rooted in interviews. And you can find extrapolations that are, 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 are you know, they, I wouldn't say they stand up to contemporary scrutiny, but they're strong given the context of their time. But you also find a lot of kind of fatuous, you know, theorizing about everything under the sun. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's a really great answer and a great question as well from Bess Williamson. So thanks, Bess. Um, I don't think there are any other questions and the bells of Cambridge are telling me that we are just about out of time. Um, so I think maybe that's an appropriate point to end. I'd just like to take a moment quickly to thank um, Alexandra Stoger, Lucy Santos, and everyone else at the BSHS who has made the Hughes Prize process uh, a really pleasant one. And thanks to all of the audience for coming um, and sharing their time, their thoughts with us. But especially thanks to you, Keith, uh, for everything that you share with us, this book, this talk, um, really, uh, we're very grateful. So Thank you, Mary. It was really a, a wonderful uh, event. And, and thanks again for the terrific honor. My pleasure. Um, and our pleasure from the BSHS. I think we'll end